For churches that follow the lecture, a lectionary, which is a set pattern of Bible readings over usually a period of years, three years in our case, an interesting dilemma can arise for preachers. Because chances are, three years ago, you preached on a sermon of the same reading. And this was my dilemma for today, because three years ago, I preached on this story of Jesus and the blind man. Now, it's been a busy couple of months, and the lure of using an old sermon was very, very real. And, and I justified it to myself by thinking, oh, I preached this in March of 2020, which just so happened to be the very first week where, due to the pandemic, we cancelled face-to-face worship and moved entirely online. No one is going to remember what I said last time. I then made the mistake of talking to Radhika about it, and she said, you can't use an old one. And I said, why? Why? No one is going to remember it. And I was expecting her to say something like, God will remember. (laughs) But that's not what she said. She said, Christina will remember. (laughs) So if nothing else, Christina, this is for you. And for the rest of you, in the future, if you think you're hearing a sermon from me that you've heard before, come and tell me and I might just give you a prize. But this dilemma is by no means limited to me and my busyness and or laziness because part of the problem is the question, what am I going to say that is different from last time? The story hasn't changed. So why would my sermon... Is there some new truth, some new angle, some new interpretation that will suddenly change everything from what it was said before? Or will it just be the same old, same old? And so as I started to think about this text and with these questions in mind, I unintentionally found myself following the example of the Pharisees in the very story I was examining. And I'll come back to that a little bit later. Now, I know it is a long story that we've just heard, so let's have a a brief recap, or at least on the bits that I'm going to talk about. Jesus and his disciples come across a blind man, and it's the Sabbath, and the disciples use him as an example to prompt a theological discussion about sin. Jesus is having none of it, and instead proceeds to heal the blind man. Now, healing on the Sabbath is a big no-no according to the Pharisees, and in hearing rumours of what happened, inadvertently create the brand new TV show, Pharisee Detectives, which is a show I would totally watch, and Jesse, you're free to use that idea in your next script. The Pharisees, who are already looking for ways to bring Jesus down, begin to investigate the incident. They interrogate the blind man. Then they interrogate his parents. And then they interrogate the blind man again, looking for that new angle, looking for that new truth. Huh? See what I did there? Because everything they knew told them that a crime had taken place here. A healing had taken place on the Sabbath. And we're usually quick to dismiss the Pharisees, understandably, most of the time, but it's also important to recognise that they were doing things by the book. Because according to Torah, it is a sin to heal on the Sabbath. So it is Jesus who is, in one sense, the criminal of this story. And yet we side with Jesus. Or at least I assume and hope we side with Jesus. Does anyone side with the Pharisees? No one? Good. Okay, great. If you've ever been in a Bible study or wine and Jesus or similar with me, you probably have heard me talk about the Wesleyan quadrilateral. And that's because it's been hugely formative for me and likely to be the basis of my master's thesis in the next year or so. But basically, the Wesleyan quadrilateral is a framework of how we develop theology, or how we think about theology. And it has four components. The four components are scripture, tradition, reason, and experience. Now, that doesn't mean that any theological idea needs to get a tick from each of these areas. In fact, a lot of the time, those four areas will exist in tension with one another. And so the framework itself doesn't give us answers as to what is right and what is wrong, but instead it helps us to engage with any theological idea more holistically. Different people and different groups will put different weights on each of the components. But more often than not, the most neglected component is experience. To the point where in some traditions, and I'll leave you to speculate on which ones they are, 
they won't talk about a quadrilateral. Instead, they will talk about how we stand on a three-legged stool of scripture, reason, and tradition. It's not all that surprising that people or groups might choose to steer away from experience because experience can be unwieldy. Experience can be hard to control. It can challenge our most established ideas and rules. And generally, we don't like being challenged. For those who were able to attend the Sydney Alliance Assembly a few weeks ago, I imagine that you would agree that one of the more powerful moments of that night was the sharing of the five or six testimonies of how the issues on the table, climate change, housing affordability, fair renting, temporary visas and more, how they were impacting the lives of everyday people. Because whilst we know and knew that these were important issues, it is the sharing of real experience that gave those stories life, that that really began to touch us. Experience, either that of my own or that of others, can take what I think that I know and make it something tangible that I can almost grasp, something that doesn't just sit in my head but grips my heart and moves my hands and my feet. So to reduce or to negate experience is to potentially dismiss the very real workings of God in the here and now. I think that's what's happening to the Pharisees. But let's not pile on too quickly because the Pharisees too have a point for us to hear. Because they are concerned with the Sabbath. And that's a noble cause, both then and even today. We are too quick sometimes to dismiss the notion of godly rest, to find the time and space to stop to reflect and to just simply be taking a break from the barrage of demands on our time and on our energy. However, it seems to me that the Pharisees were only really focused on the ideas of scripture and tradition in that moment. And you can probably think reason there too because what we understand to be reasonable or to be common sense is often influenced influenced by scripture and tradition. And so the focus of the Pharisees meant that they were unable to register the experience of that moment. But the blind man, or now just the man, I guess, doesn't let it slip away because he offers what I think is one of the most amazing lines in Scripture. Speaking of Jesus, he says, I do not know whether he is a sinner. One thing I do know that though I was blind, now I see. In that moment, experience trumps everything else. Majestic in its simplicity and yet invisible to the Pharisees who could only see it as an act of rule-breaking. There's a story that I shared from this pulpit before and probably will again because it's an experience that has shaped and formed me. When I was studying to be a minister, I spent six months at Westmead Hospital as a student chaplain. And I was on call on one weekend. And on the Friday evening, about five minutes after I clocked on, I received a page. Somebody wanted a chaplain. I think that was actually the first time I was on call, so I was freaking out. And in that moment, I also was acutely aware for myself that... Friday nights were one of my unspoken Sabbath times. I mean, who wants to work on a Friday night? But the challenge of such pages and hospital calls is that you rarely know the severity of the situation. It's possible that I could have made the decision to go in the next day instead, and maybe, maybe that would have been fine. But what happened is I decided to go to the hospital that night. And I walked into one of the strangest and most profound encounters of my life. I had then since heard that this man that had asked for a chaplain didn't have long to live and was struggling with the idea of dying. And one of the things that we're taught in clinical pastoral education is to let the patient do the talking. And so I entered the room 
And I introduced myself to the patient and his partner, a Filipino man, and I sat down and waited to hear what he wanted to talk about. And I waited and waited and waited. And eventually, I, I just couldn't take it anymore. I asked him, is there anything that you want to talk about? He considered it for a moment and then simply said, not right now, I will let you know though. So I returned to my waiting. I spent about 90 minutes with this man before it was clear that he was falling asleep. At which point I said my goodbyes and I left. And then as I reflected in that moment, all I could think about was how weird it was and how useless I was. But I headed home and took some time to rest the next day. And I didn't think too much more about it uh, until over a week later when I received a call from the chaplain, the United Church chaplain at Westmead. The man I had visited had passed away exactly a week after I had sat with him. And what came next was a huge shock because that family of that man requested that I take his funeral. So that's the story of the first time that I did a funeral. And I've spent much time reflecting on the idea of why me? What did I do? And from what I can determine, my learning in CPE had given me a huge gift that I wasn't even aware of because the man at that time didn't need words. He didn't need conversation. He needed acceptance. He needed to know that even though his church community had rejected him because of his sexuality, that the church universal had not. And more importantly, that he was loved by God and that simply by spending time with him, I had accepted him and loved him for who he was. As I mentioned, this is a really formative part of my ministerial training and part of its important is the reality that I didn't know what I was doing. I followed the theories that I'd been taught But inside, I was a bundle of nerves. What am I doing? What should I be doing? Should I say something? Should I leave? This is really awkward. The reality is that I was not prepared for that encounter. But it also doesn't matter, because God was. What happened there was not about me, but about God, and God's love for a dying man. And I had the privilege of being present for it. There's two parts to this story that, which connect to the story of Jesus and the blind man for me. The first is a challenging of Sabbath. Because if Sabbath becomes a legality for us, as the Pharisees saw it, if I had claimed Sabbath on that Friday night, then what? I may have missed that encounter. I may have missed all that it meant for the patient and all that it meant for me. Sabbath is important. But sometimes we need to be flexible because God might be doing a new thing and we just need to be part of it. The second part is recognising that I had no answers in that encounter. And as it turned out, that wasn't a bad thing. In fact, in that moment, it was a blessing. Sometimes we put too much pressure on ourselves and on others to have the answers to know exactly what to say, to know exactly how to think. But it doesn't always work like that, and particularly when we're talking about God. I was really grateful for the time I shared with those who took part in the atonement short course last year, atonement being the meaning that we we put about the death of Jesus. And I know that a number of people came with the hope of discovering the answer, the thing that would help make It all makes sense. But what we talked about in that class was that there isn't just one way to think about atonement. We discussed six different ways to think about it, and that wasn't a complete list. We talked about ransom, we talked about satisfaction, about Christus Victor, about penal substitution, about scapegoat, about nonviolent atonement theory. And so instead of discovering the answer... We instead discovered a variety of possibilities, all of which are incomplete, 
but all of which that add value into the ongoing exploration into the mystery that is God and the wonder that is the life and death and resurrection of Jesus. But even within that mystery, within that unknowing, there are things to hold on to. A number of people expressed that despite the uncertainty around atonement, they still felt truly loved by God. And that brings us back to the man who was, who was blind, his wonderful words. I do not know whether he was a sinner. One thing I do know was that I was blind and now I see. He didn't know whether Jesus was breaking the rules or not. He wasn't well versed in deep Christology or church history or tradition. But what he knows is that once he was blind and now he sees. What he knows is the amazing experience of God's grace and he doesn't need to explain that. He doesn't need to justify it or rationalise it. What he knows is that once he was blind but now he sees. It's not too dissimilar to the story of the Samaritan woman that Radhika preached on last week. Because by the accounts of scripture or reason or tradition, it would be easy to dismiss that interaction as unimportant. But when we allow the unique experience of the Samaritan woman and the aftermath of her interaction with Jesus and hear her simple act of evangelism through the words, come and see, we find that we too are invited into that story into that experience, into the grace of God. Friends, you never need to explain or justify the grace that you have experienced in Jesus Christ. You never need to respond to those who question it or reject it or dismiss it because you're just the wrong type of person, because you're the wrong gender, the wrong sexuality, the wrong class. Each one of us are recipients of God's grace which says that you are a beloved child of God and there's nothing you can do to change that. And may that experience be something that you can hold on to in those times when all else falls away. Know this, now and forever, you are beloved. In the name of the crucified and risen one. Amen.